Texas during uh, the period after Reconstruction is um, a fascinating place where it's not at all unusual that outlaws would have been admired greatly. There was a lot of resentment uh, about the aftermath of the Civil War. There was the rise of robber barons, uh, banks. Also, there was a lot of resentment that was still left over from a lot of this wealth that was unevenly distributed. On Saturday night, we would have campfires, and I distinctly remember one being south of the Lake Louisville, uh, where the dam is. Well, that was all pasture land in those days, and it was ideal for camping out. And I believe there's a subdivision there now, but I distinctly remember around the campfire, there was, we would sing these songs about Sam Bass and these, the legends of Sam Bass. And I w we would hear the older people talk about how Sam Bass used to roam the area and, uh, and there's hidden gold in the hills. And, and uh, so we would tear up the landscape looking for gold in the hills that Sam Bass had deposited. Never found a penny. As a young man, Sam Bass, uh, along with his brothers and sisters, were farmed out to other relatives because of the death of their parents. And uh, he resented quite a bit his being treated like another employee rather than a, a family member. Sam decided to run away from home. He was about 17 years of age at the time. He made his way to St. Louis for a while and then went down the Mississippi to a small town called Rosedale. He worked at a mill there for a while. According to his sister, he learned to, to fire pistols and, uh, and do that sort of thing, although most people who actually knew him said he was never a very good shot at all. He was a very likable person. He was polite, opened the doors for the ladies, uh, said yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. Uh, was a very courteous person. He, uh, good morning, how are you? And so consequently, he was very liked by a lot of people. Sam Bass was not very pleased with the progress his life was taking, just working on ranches and doing general housework and that sort of thing. And he, I think he had a desire to make more money. Some early letters indicate that he wanted to buy land and be a cattleman. So at one point, he and the younger brother of Sheriff Egan, Army Egan, bought a gray mare. And uh, it was a pretty good gray mare, said to be the, 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 uh, a descendant from the famous racehorse Steel Dust. They began to race it. And what you did back then was you went on somebody's South 40 somewhere. Uh, and you set up these, uh, these horse races and matches and they would bet animals and money and whiskey and guns and that sort of thing. Sheriff Egan took exception to his younger brother being involved in this horse racing because quite often at these races, they ended up being drunken brawls and fights and that sort of thing. And Sheriff Egan was a rather moral man. So he literally paid off Sam Bass for Army Egan's interest in the horse. At this point, Sam takes up with a new partner named Joel Collins, who owned a part interest in the saloon there. And Joel took uh, an interest in the horse. They raced it for a while in San Antonio. And Joel Collins, who was from a Dallas family, sold his uh, interest in the saloon. They sold the horse and decided to take a cattle drive up to the north. Sam Bass and Joel Collins and others rounded up a herd and took them north. The problem was they sold them and didn't come back. They kept the money. At any rate, they ended up in the Black Hills with money in their pockets. Black Hills at that time was just alive with miners uh, who were looking for gold in the Black Hills in violation of the treaty with the Sioux at the time. And it was a prime market for, for robbers. Uh, so Sam went into the freight business to try to bring supplies, but was an abysmal failure. Joel Collins and Sam Bass found themselves in the Black Hills with no money. So they looked around for another means of income, and stage robbery presented itself as the most feasible approach. Sam Bass has a legend as being a folk hero, and I believe that that legend continues to this day, and I think partly the legend started from the fact that he was robbing railroads. Well, particularly here in Texas, railroads were hated by the farmer because the only way the farmer had to move his livestock or his crops to market were through the trains. Well, there was only one railroad, so they charged whatever they wanted, and you had to pay whatever they charged. So they were, railroads were hated. So consequently, anybody who robbed the railroad and gave to the poor was probably seen as a folk hero. Uh, Sam Bass and Joel Collins and the gang that they had, had formed 
uh, Red Berry and, and Jack Davis and Tom Nixon and others decided to rob a train. They scouted around for a likely site on the Union Pacific Rail, which ran from east to west to through Omaha. They picked the little town of Big Spring, or actually the little watering hole of Big Spring, in September of, of 1877. Winter was coming on, they needed to do something for income, and so they thought train robbery would be the best bet. So in September of 1877, the gang went to the Big Spring station, attempted to break the telegraph key, and then held up the train when it came in. The engineer, the express conductor, all of them thought it was a joke until they presented their pistols. They beat the express messenger until they told him where some money was. The big luck was that they stumbled across some chests with newly minted $20 gold pieces just out of San Francisco. $60,000 worth. Now in 1877, $60,000 would be well over a million now in terms of what it was worth. Six men with 10,000 apiece thought they'd hit the gold mine. They didn't see themselves as criminals, even though they were indeed outlaws. And it seems that a majority of the people felt the same way. They were beloved. They were actually embraced by the community. And in some ways, it's that excitement, that kind of democratic spirit of rebellion that is something that people seem to identify with and seems central to the reason that these tales are so um, widely accepted and beloved. After the robbery, Bass and Collins and the gang went back to Ogallala, where they had started, and were very nonchalantly posing as cowboys headed to, prepared to head south. They'd buried their, their loot in the sand across the Republican River, and so we're going to pick it up on the way back. In the meantime, a merchant by the name of M.F. Leach, who was a would-be detective and had some experience as a detective, decided to investigate. The express company had offered major rewards for the recovery of both the loot and the men that were responsible. The Army was sending out patrols from various forts that were around the area, and so it was pretty hot and heavy looking for this gang. They had to leave Nebraska because uh, the detective services and the federal marshals were hot on their trail. So they came back to Texas where they were from. Sam Bass was basically afraid that the railroad detectives were going to come down and arrest him. They did come down and arrest Henry Underwood, and thinking he was one of the Big Spring train robbers, and they took him back to Nebraska and put him under a $100,000 bond. So in February of 1878, Sam, along with Seaburn Barnes, Frank Jackson, a man named Thomas Spotswood held up the Allen train north of Dallas. The night before the train robbery, which was February 22nd, 1878, the Sam Bass and gang scouted out the Allen area and they went to Tom Newman's saloon. They asked the bartender what time the train came in, what time the train departs. So they had an idea of the train uh, schedule from accounts of the bartender. They did get off with about uh, anywhere from twelve to fifteen hundred dollars worth, worth of money and one of the interesting things when we read about these robbery accounts and, and these days we forget that twelve to fifteen hundred dollars in 1878 would be like fifty thousand or maybe a hundred thousand today. It was quite a bit of money because even in, 19, in the 1930s the average person only made a couple dollars a day. The express messengers and the, the railroad companies were literally camping on the governor's door demanding that there be rangers, that they be provided with, with arms and ammunition to guard the train, that something be done about this terrible, terrible dilemma. And the response was after the, the uh, Mesquite train robbery to form a company of rangers in, in Dallas for one month. 30 men to specifically look for the Bass Gang. Now, a lot of people really weren't sympathetic with the railroads at this time because of their bad reputation at, at uh, getting right of way away from private owners of land and that sort of thing. And they were thought of, like many big corporations, as just as much crooks as the bandits that held them up. The Sam Bass train robbery and the Sam Bass robbery subsequent to the Allen, Texas robbery were very important for the future of Texas law enforcement. One must remember that this robbery occurred 13 years after the Civil War. And so, consequently, there wasn't a lot of organized police. Uh, the, the Texas Rangers were, their main mission in the early days were to protect the settlers against Native American and uh, Mexican bandits. With the demand on the governor for something to be done about these train robberies, the governor, through the adjutant general, 
and Major John B. Jones, who was then head of what was called the Frontier Battalion, as we know the Texas Rangers, to do something about it. Jones came up to Dallas and recruited Junius or June Peak as to head up a company of 30 men for one month to try to track down the Bass Gang. Now, June Peak was an experienced deputy sheriff, former city marshal of Dallas, and at the particular time was their city recorder or judge at the time. He resigned that position to accept a position as lieutenant in the Rangers for one month, and this became a detachment of Company B. Then they began recruiting the 30 men, and they all eagerly came forward, most of them farm boys, but knew how to ride a horse, they had to bring their own weapon, and they were paid $30 a month. This was the first time, as I recall, that the Texas Rangers were used to, to apprehend an Anglo citizen. Uh, and so consequently, uh, it gave a, a, a new purpose to the Texas Rangers. It, it gave them a lesson that they needed to be more had better communication with each other, better communication with law enforcement. And of course, these are the days before internet and where everybody could get on the net and see what the other one's doing. Uh, they had to be uh, more closely coordinated and organized to, to apprehend a, a, a criminal that was a threat like Sam Bass. When Lieutenant Peake started after the Bass Gang in Denton County, he was joined by posses from Sheriff Egan in Denton County from Sheriff Everhart in Grayson County, Sherman, and they pursued the gang all over. Their tactic was to be an aggressive one, and that was to bring in anybody who had thought to harbor or give an assistance or aid to the Bass Gang in any way. And since they were dealing with federal crimes, in other words, robbery of the mails, this was treated through federal court, which at that time was located in Tyler, Texas, in Smith County, some miles away. So people were being arrested right and left and taken to Tyler and held under high bonds. And of course, this certainly disrupted a lot of families. One of the families that was tar targeted was the Murphy family. Henderson Murphy was an old time settler of Denton County and had two sons, Robert and Jim. All three were taken into custody. And in the meantime, two members of the gang at, at Mesquite, Sam Pipes and Albert Herndon, were arrested by the Rangers in Dallas County and were held. The rest had fled. Murphys were taken to Tyler. Jim Murphy, got out on bond, but he was not allowed to release Tyler. So he got in contact with Major Jones and with Deputy Marshal Walter Johnson and with the District Attorney A.J. Evans and said, look, my father had nothing to do. He knew the Bass Gang, but he had nothing to do with harboring them. It's not right that you keep him. He's an elderly man. So they struck a deal and put it in writing that if Jim Murphy would make his best efforts to get Bass and Barnes and Johnson and Underwood and Arkansas Johnson, who had now joined the gang when Underwood escaped from Nebraska, uh, then they would dismiss the charge against him. Then they allowed him the fiction of jumping his bond with the promise they'd take care of his bondsman who didn't know about it. And Murphy made his way back to Denton County to try to find the Bass Gang. The Bass Gang at the meantime had been chased all over northern Texas by the Rangers. They'd been to Palo Pinto County, Stevens County, and finally in Wise County, Peake and his men caught up with them and they killed Arkansas Johnson killed some of the horses and the gang had to flee on foot. Underwood abandoned the gang at this time and picked up his family and went back to Indiana. And that left Bass and Seaburn Barnes and Frank Jackson to make their way back to Denton County where they met Jim Murphy. Murphy lived here in Denton and he elected to let the Texas Rangers know that where Bass was going to, which was uh, Round Rock, and as a result of his information, Bass was apprehended, Bass was shot, and the, the, bang was, the, the Sam Bass gang was disbanded. But there were those who thought Murphy was a bad guy for turning in his fellow folks in the gang. Well, I'm telling you, I think that he was a good guy because he probably saved a lot of lives later on. To show you, the, to show you the, how the legend continued until recently, it was believed that Mercy, Murphy died this, either through suicide. I, I distinctly remember people telling me that he died of suicide for so much shame for turning in Sam Bass. Well, Rick Miller in his research in the last 10 years clearly uh, documented that Sam, uh, Murphy died from, I believe the treatment for a certain eye infection was mercury, and somehow the mercury went, ran down his nose and killed him. 
And <clears throat> here Rick Miller, and the documentation for that was clearly available. And here it took Rick Miller to do the research over 125 years later to show Murphy didn't die of a suicide because he had so much shame about turning in bass. He died of because of a medical ailment and the treatment that went uh, badly uh, in the, in, at that time. With Sam Bass, I think it's particularly important to note that it's the villains that make the heroes, and him as an accidental outlaw folk hero has more to do with the villains of the tale, I think. The suspicion and skepticism they had with law enforcement officials who are either portrayed as corrupt, as in the Ballad of Sam Bass, or inept, and also a kind of anxiety about the, the failure to get protection from these. Now, the Robin Hood aspect of it also really reflects how the common person saw Sam Bass as being a helper. I mean, these were very hard times for people. And so the legends of him passing out $20 gold coins is something that certainly fueled the popular imagination and made him a very popular figure. Obviously, along the way, this myth was perpetuated and reinforced by different people I had interacted with here in North Texas area. But then as an adult, as I started studying his behaviors, his the, the facts of his robbery and the methods of his robbery, I consider him a thug. I do not consider him a folk hero at all. Quite honestly, a lot of times the stories that we tell come from these formulas is the reason that they resemble so much the stories of Robin Hood, the stories of William Wallace, the Scarlet Pimpernel, is that this is a familiar tale and these characters are often made more sympathetic in the telling and it may be in large part because this, they are the heroes that we need them to be. They are the heroes that the society needs at the time. And the fact that these outlaws are a persistent, persistent characters within our public imagination, I think reflects something about you know, our independent spirit and this romantic mythos of the West. So certainly these were preserved in, this romantic mythos of the West was preserved in Hollywood movies and these stories are a way of conveying how the everyday person views their kind of community solidarity. These figures are also central to, you know, local identities. Round Rock is very much tied up in the legend of Sound Bass. Uh, Denton, Texas, uh, talking to some men in the barber shop, were very excited to talk about these tales that they've known ever since they were small. Uh, I think it's certainly an interesting uh, part of our history. And, you know, I, I think it's kind of important that, you know, we kind of keep our heart a little bit in our history, but you know, we, we cast our vision to the future. So I can kind of relate to some of the people that want to move away from that and not be so much a part of what Round Rock is, but um, it's, uh, it's an integral part of, of who we were and where we came from. And you know, one of the things that, that speaks highly about the whole event of Sam Bass was one of our major thoroughfares now is called A.W. Grimes, which uh, A.W. Grimes is the law officer that shot Sam Bass, so uh, the city council decided to do that to try to honor, uh, you know, the commitment and the service of the law enforcement officers that were involved in the gun fight. When it comes to the stories of myth and legend, a professor once told me, one should never let the facts of the story interfere with the truth of the tale. The legend of Sam Bass is a fantastic illustration that the truth in this tale is far more important than the factual history that people quibble over.